Yes, the church. Do we have a king? They say, of course. I-N-R-I. What does the R stand for on the cross? Rex. King. Do you have a sacrifice? You sure do. Calvary. You have the Lamb of God. Do you have a high priest? Read Hebrews chapter 5, 6, and 7. Please. The Tanakh says openly that the last section of Jewish history will be a long time, 2,000 years. Okay? That's a long time by any measure. And then, and during that period of time, you'll have none of those things. This is an existential threat to the church. Christianity can't be true. Dual prophecy. If it's dual prophecy, there where's, has to be two. Right, where's our first virgin? Man. Fine. Dual yeah. prophecy. I, I grant it all. Man, where's brilliant. the virgin during Isaiah's time? Welcome to Tanakh Talk. I'm your host, William Hall, broadcasting live out of Kingsland, Texas, USA, with another episode of our Toby Singers. Let's get the Q and A coming to you. Rabbi Toby, the man singer, myth of legend. Welcome back, my dear friend, how are you? Uh, how is things going? Um, I'm hoping good news is still sticking with us about your father, uh, praying that he uh, will reach his potential of 120 plus. Amen. 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 I mean, thank you so much. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, so with your permission, we will go ahead and kick this show off and take this first question. Yeah, my name is Bob from New York. I had a question about uh, Isaiah seven fourteen. It's obviously not talking about Jesus. You could just read the text, and it, you know it's talking about during the time of King Ahaz, what was going to happen then, not seven hundred years later. And uh, my question is, if it's plainly talking about that King Ahaz and 700 years before Jesus, Christians would have to admit it's not talking about Jesus. And then they, they try to claim there's dual fulfillments or whatever. My question is, is there such a thing as dual fulfillment of prophecy or not dual fulfillments? That's my question. Thank you. The question of the century. <laughs> really? Yeah. Take it away. Yeah. That's a that's a great question, and as it turns out, um, Christians are just not familiar with Isaiah chapter seven. What they're familiar with is Matthew, one twenty three. So, you know, although Jewish people who are watching right now feel incensed, and how could all these hundreds of millions, billions of Christians just be lying right through their teeth, and and all those things, I to their credit, it's important to know that almost no Christian has ever read Isaiah chapter 7 from beginning to end. So it's important to know that your average Christian, when I say average, it's not like average, like more than 50% or 60%. It's 99.99% just has just never read the chapter in their lives. Although all Christians believe that the book of Isaiah, all 66 chapters, is the Word of God. So to that, just to understand that Christians are not familiar with anything you've just said, but you are absolutely correct. As it turns out, the book of Matthew, chapter 1, verse 23, the one of two infancy narratives found in the Christian Bible, mistranslates, misappropriates, a very famous passage in Isaiah to support the notion that Jesus was conceived miraculously to Mary. You are absolutely correct. If you read Isaiah 7 in context, and if you're a Christian, I implore you to open up Isaiah 7, but instead of doing what, uh, what the pastor or priest does in church, just start from verse 1. It is axiomatic that the author of the book of Isaiah presupposed that by the time we got to verse 14, you've read the 13 verses that introduce it. As it turns out, it's part of a larger pericope. What's going on? There's an ephro syria war. That's the context of Isaiah 7.14. Uh, syria, the king was Ritsin, formed an alliance with the northern kingdom of Israel. Not Judah, the southern kingdom, but the northern kingdom of Israel. 
against the southern kingdom, the king of the south of Judah was Ahaz, a very wicked man. The king of the northern kingdom of Israel was Pekach ben Ramaliohu. Okay? So there's a civil war. Ahaz is a very wicked king. He's a direct descendant of King David and Solomon. So in terms of his genealogy, it was airtight. But he himself was a cruel and wicked king. Possibly one of the worst Davidic kings. No, I retract that. He was the worst Davidic king that ever lived. He never repented. He ruled for 16 years from 20, and he died when he was 36 years old. The point being that Isaiah, in this context, is giving Ahaz, the king of Judah, a sign so he'll know when these two kings, again, Ritzin, Syria, not Assyria, but Syria, Aram, and Pekach ben Ramayohu, the king of the northern king of Israel. Remember, at that time, there was a civil war. So at that time, the northern king of Israel and the southern king of Israel were, um, well, they were at war with each other. And God, through the prophet Isaiah, tells the southern kingdom's king that, look, these two kingdoms will be destroyed by the time this child who is born to a young woman will mature. For before the child knows to reject evil and choose good, these two kings will be abandoned. So when the text says, behold, the young woman is with a child, hineo al ledes bain, is with a son, Vikaros Shemo Emmanuel, and she will call his name Emmanuel. Matthew completely mistranslates that. There's no word virgin there. Matthew eviscerates the definite article, changes it from she will call his name to they will call his name. So if you just compare Isaiah 714, now if you do this with a Christian Bible, you're dead, you're fried. You have no chance. Just go back to church and ignore me. You'd have to go back to the original Hebrew, or, I mean, if you just can't read a lick of Hebrew, you, you, the way you say Alma, the way you say virgin is Betula. That is the only way to convey virginity. Excuse me, did I, the word Betula is the only way to convey virginity. The word Alma, a young woman, only conveys, well, two things. It conveys gender, female, and young, young woman. But the key is that this has nothing to do with Jesus. It has nothing to do with something that's going to happen in 700 years. It's an immediate crisis, and Isaiah is providing the reluctant King Ahaz a solution to a very serious problem. Now, Ahaz is a bad guy. He doesn't want any part of this. He's reluctant. He wants to take off like the Marcuses did, who led the... Um, who, what was it, the Philippine, uh, the uh, Panama, whatever it was. They just, he wants to go. Isaiah is saying, look, here's the deal. Now, the problem that you're raising is brilliant, and that is, this has nothing to do with any Messiah at all, has nothing to do with 700 years from now. How would this be a source of comfort? And this has nothing to do, has nothing to do with the virgin birth, nothing. Everything's wrong. Why don't Christians see that? The reason is that Christians don't read this chapter in context. They, know, It's just the usual suspects in the Hebrew Bible that they memorize. So Isaiah 7, 14, that's all they know. They don't see butter and honey, will the child eat when it knows to reject bad and choose good, verse 15, for before the child. They don't read that, okay? So it's not like uh, Christians are, are are just bad faith actors. They're not. Even their pastors don't know this, unless they're the absolute scholars and they, you know, have got master's degrees. So then they learn it and they got to struggle with it. They have to find these torturous explanations, which we're going to address right now. So I just I do not want you walking away from this conversation thinking that uh, all Christians are just lying faking, none of that. They just they absolutely have no clue. Moreover, the Christian Bible, their translations have all been corrupted. The Septuagint, all corrupted. All of it's been corrupted by the church so that Christians have no access to the original Hebrew, which an Orthodox child, child, 
could read biblical Hebrew, Lahavdu, the way you could read a newspaper. Do, do you understand all this? Now, the question is, well, what do the, there are Christians that are try to come up with some sort of way out of this? How do you get out of this mess? So it's not like no Christian ever stumbled upon this. They've got whole websites trying to figure out a way to defend this. One of them you raise right now, and it's one of those responses that kind of make you stop and scratch your head for a moment. At first glance, it seems to be, at first glance, it seems to be a, there's a dual prophecy. Now, let me just explain. Now, the word dual prophecy doesn't appear anywhere in Tanakh. Nowhere, okay? Hey, give me strength. So there's no, but let's just, we're going to leave that alone. What I want to do is just explain this argument, and I'm going to ignore the elephant in the room that the term dual prophecy doesn't exist anywhere. But this is the argument, because I just want to, or else we'll, so what what does this mean? What they're saying is, look, in the Bible, you can have a prophecy which is dealing with, which is addressing the immediate surrounding event, in this case, Ahaz, during the Assyrian Empire, but there's a hidden meaning which really is speaking about event in the future as well, a secondary meaning. So this prophecy is fulfilled twice. That's what dual prophecy means. Now, right away, you know you're being scammed. Why? Because when you go to church... When you're approached by a missionary, that's not what you're told. Here's what you're told. There are 365 prophecies in the Old Testament which clearly demonstrate that Jesus is the Messiah. So what's happening is, you know, you you, you, you go online, you order something, you think you're getting a great deal, and instead of getting a great pair of Bose headphones, you open the box, it's a big box, and there's a balloon inside that's broken. Well, you're going, I've just been ripped off. Well, that, that's what's happening. So you're being sold on, this is a clear prophecy, and then when you examine it, and you don't have to go really close, you just scratch the surface, you're going, whoa, this is a compl- this is a com- this is not what I was told when I signed up for church, okay? But what I want to do is I want to ignore that as well because I want to really address this issue really quite directly. And you'll see that this claim is completely fatuous. Listen carefully. If the claim is that there's a prophecy in Isaiah, which everyone admits, if you read it in context, is addressing a crisis where You have two kingdoms, Syria and the northern kingdom, going to war with the southern kingdom of Israel. The southern kingdom essentially begins where Jerusalem is and just goes south. Okay, so everything south of Jerusalem, which would include Bethlehem, Hebron, all that, all that is the kingdom of Judah. So the the argument goes like this. It is true that this prophecy is about the immediate event, but it has a dual prophecy, means it's fulfilled twice, meaning it's also going to be fulfilled in the time of Jesus. Seven, Jesus' Christianity began 700 years after Isaiah. Isaiah lived about 2,700 years ago. You got that? Okay. Remember something I've shared with you, and that is when you lie, it's a very bad idea, because what happens when you lie? I'm old enough to remember Watergate, and some of you are old enough to remember it as well. Why are people petrified of lying? We don't want to lie, but there's another reason, and that is you, you, you can't keep up with the lies. So you always get yourself into all kinds of trouble. So... No people don't want to lie, but besides that, what we you can't keep track of all your lies. You have to be a genius. If you're telling the truth, as Mark Twain said, you don't have to keep track of anything. It'll just work out. Okay, what what's the problem here if you say dual prophecy? This is a conceited all. So now you have an existential problem that makes all the other problems seem insignificant. If you're saying that the word Alma in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, means a virgin, which Christians insist, which is complete nonsense, it's just 
just, it's a lie. But let's concede that for a moment. If the word Alma, as the church claims, means a virgin, which it doesn't, but let's say it does, that means there are two virgins here. So you should be asking the Christian, fine, where is our first virgin? If there are two virgins, one in the time of Isaiah and Ahaz, during the Assyrian Empire, approximately 2,700 years ago, and then there's another one, another virgin 2,000 years ago, and that, we're told, is Mary, who gives birth to Jesus without the, without sleeping with Joseph, but rather being impregnated by the Holy Ghost, who is our first virgin? And the Christian would have to go, well, there was no first virgin. Well, then there's no dual prophecy. Moreover, it just gets worse. This becomes a nightmare. Listen very carefully. You probably have never heard this before. You must look at the context, but I want to just focus you in on Isaiah 14, 15, and 16. Read it all, but for a moment. The sign is not the conception or birth of the child. Now, the name of the child, Emmanuel, is very important. See Isaiah chapter 8, verse 10. Very important because God is with us. God is with the southern kingdom. But let's set that aside for a moment. The sign is not the birth or conception of the child. The sign is in verse 15 and 16. How does verse 15 begin? Butter and honey will the child eat, this little boy eat, when he knows to reject bad and choose good. Now, what does butter and honey mean? Well, butter and honey are foods that have to be cultivated. Right? If you're under siege, if you've got all you, you got bread and water, if you're lucky. So butter and honey means it's all good. By the way, wh why did we invent butter? You, we you probably don't know this. Although butter tastes good, it may not be great for you. The reason why butter was invented was in the ancient, really not just the ancient world, but just not that long ago. What did you do when you milked a cow? Fine, you can drink the milk then, but it, it won't stay long. How do you preserve it if you don't have a refrigerator? So you turn it into butter, and butter will stick around a long time. We then, as we did with all these foods, we figured out how to make them into delicacies. But butter, the point is that it's going to be around a long time. You get it? So butter and honey will a child e eat when he knows to reject bad and choose good. I mean, he's still a baby. He's still a why? Because before the child knows to reject bad and choose good, these two kings, namely the king of Syria, Ritzin, and the king of Israel, Pekach ben Ramayahu, they'll be destroyed. So I want to ask you, if this is a dual prophecy, let's say I concede everything. Here are your problems. Number one, who is the virgin in the time of Ahaz in Isaiah? Doesn't exist. Two, who are the two kings during the time of Jesus? doesn't exist. Who, which baby had butter, in, did Jesus have butter and honey? And before Jesus knew to reject good and choose, uh, to reject evil and choose good, the two kings were destroyed? You see what happens? So it doesn't work. It just collapses. Does this work on Google? Yeah. Does it work for people who love Jesus? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. But the whole thing's a scam. It's com a complete sham. So it's not that w you, there can't be a dual prophecy. Of course, of course, of course, you can have events where God saved the patriarchs. And the same way that God delivered the children of Israel in ancient times, that God will deliver the Jews in the future. Sure, of course. But to say this is a dual prophecy, well, that's complete nonsense. Because if it's a dual prophecy, you have no virgin birth during the time of Isaiah, and you have no two kings during the time of Jesus. Case closed. And I rest my case. Thank you so much for your question. Just so you know, I have never heard that angle on this before. This topic comes up like a lot, a lot, a lot in so many circles. And I've heard a lot of explanations. I've never heard it from that angle before. I never thought about that before. Where's you the know, other? something I, I try to do on the show <laughs> is always Man. just take another angle, yeah. you know, like take it from another direction. 
It is. Right. It, it was great. I mean, dual prophecy. If it's dual prophecy, there where's, has to be two. Right. Where's our first virgin? Man, where's the brilliant. virgin during Isaiah's time? Fine. Dual yeah. prophecy. I, I grant it all. But if I grant that, then you're pro- this is the problem with Watergate. The problem was the cover-up. If it wasn't for the cover-up, you know, Barry Goldwater wouldn't have walked into Nixon's office and said, look, we, we can't help you out here. Mm. <laughs> it's the cover-up, stupid. So that's wow. what happens. If you go for the d- dual prophecy, you have not solved your problem. You've compounded your problem. That's insane. Okay, very good. Good job. Okay, take the next caller. Caller, you're live. Michael Martell, please present your question to Rabbi. Hi, my name is Mike Martell from Minnesota. How are you guys? Thank you for having the show and refuah refu- shlomo to your father, Rabbi. Thank you. Uh, my question is, is um, in uh, Matthew 24, 22, uh, it states that one of the signs of the end times would be the shortening of days. And I was wondering if this was something that is also uh, taught or uh, told in Tanakh, and if not, uh, what are the signs that the Mashiach will come in the end times, according to Tanakh? Okay, go ahead and hang down to me if you have to take it, Michael. Yeah, in our conversation we were talking about just generally, because there's a lot of things in Revelation that seems prophetic, things in Matthew that seems prophetic. I mean, is it possible we could trust anything in the New Testament? Take it away, Rabbi. So... Matthew 24 contains what's called the Olivet Discourse. It has its corresponding, there are corresponding um, chapters that are not identical, uh, Luke 21, um, Mark 13. But these are just, um, they're just very vague. You know, there, there were people, thinkers, you know, who lived just a couple of years ago, just said things that are very vague, and I mean, thought these were prophecies. So, no, Tanakh is very clear of what would happen in the end of days. Very specifically, as a precursor to the coming of Mashiach, the children of Israel would be attacked. In fact, there would be a what's called Jacob's Trouble. Jacob's Trouble is um, Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7, where the Jews would endure the worst tribulation. It literally says that. There's no day like it. But from the great tribulation, the greatest tribulation, you will be delivered. Um, so there, are, there is um, Ezekiel 38 and 39, for example, where the prophet tells us about Mechamis Gog, a confederacy of nations that attack the Jewish people in the, in the land of Israel over Jerusalem. Please see Zechariah 14. You know, I know I frequently criticize, don't take it personally, but I sometimes come down on my viewers for not studying Tanakh enough. Zechariah is a more difficult book. It's not incredibly difficult, but it's not that easy. There are more difficult books in Tanakh than Zechariah. However, the easiest chapter to learn and understand is Zechariah 12. It's very, very easy. So the book of Zechariah begins with eight visions. It's not that simple. It's not, you know, nuclear physics, you know, but it's, or, you know, it's not organic chemistry, but it's, but this chapter tells us clearly that before Mashiach comes, the Jewish people return to the land of Israel. Nations come to attack her to stroll over Yerushalayim, and God destroys them all. And then once the Jews are in there to stroll, and that God will destroy all the nations that come up against Jerusalem. This is these. What I want to show is, what I want to illustrate is a very specific uh, prophecies that are highly falsifiable. They're very specific that at the end of days before Mashiach comes, the Jews return to the land of Israel and there's a state and there's an army and nations that surround Eretz Yisrael attack Eretz Yisrael and Jerusalem will be a heavy burdensome stone to all the nations that come against it. You understand? I, I, I'm trying to you know, contrast this with, you know, there'll be wars and rumors of wars. Very vague. You can apply it to, you know, anything. Right now, according to the U.S. State Department, 
there are nearly 30 wars going on in the world today, okay? You are very familiar with at least two of them. Very familiar with them, because those two wars are in the headlines every day. But there are a lot of other wars going on that you're not familiar with, okay? So, and there are always wars and rumors of wars. And Tanakh doesn't talk, doesn't use this vague stuff or anything, and you know, you know, earthquakes. Forget all that. Tanakh is very simple. Then what happens is. Right before Mashiach comes, there is a tremendous trauma where the nation is attacked and people are killed. They turn to God because of the ones who who are murdered. And they will look to me because of the one or ones who are killed, peers. And they will mourn over him like one mourns over firstborn son. That's called Mashiach Ben Yosef. It has nothing to do with Mashiach, but it just means that right before the Messiah comes, there's going to be a tremendous trauma to the nation of Israel. Do I believe that's October 7th? I do. I'm not sure. I didn't hear voices. I didn't see visions. But that is, you know, it's that kind of, trauma which unites the nation into a national state of mourning. Okay? That's all. See, what what I want to convey to you, what I'd like you to uh, taste, is the nature of these prophecies. These are not these vague wars and rumors of wars and earthquake. What does that mean? Like, what earthquake? What? Right? I, I lived in Indonesia, okay? Indonesia is the midst of the ring of fire. So Indonesia is one of the 14 countries that sits on the equator. It's hot. <laughs> and many of the islands are absolutely gorgeous. Right? Like it's never ever cold. Like cars in Indonesia, I just discovered this at some point living there. Actually, all they have is air conditioning. There's no heater. Because it just never, ever, 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 it never goes into the 60s, ever, never. It's like just hot and hotter. It's not insane. There are much hotter places because there's ocean, it's islands, so there's a breeze, but it's, how did we get into that conversation? I'm not sure. But the point is, ah, Indonesia is a place that because of where it's located, there are earthquakes frequently, frequently, and believe me, as a New Yorker, it's hard to tell from my British accent, but as a New Yorker, I could tell you, I was not acclimated to earthquakes. It was, I don't know if the word routine is the correct term. It just happened a lot, okay? In Brooklyn, when we said the neighborhood's going downhill, we did not mean it literally, okay? Indonesia has volcanoes, serious volcano issues. I mean... I can go into this, but it's a whole, it's a whole deal. Stuff goes down there, okay? So, the, you know, Jerusalem, Eretz Israel, is on a fault line, okay? Just so like you have a tectonic shifting of plates, you know, off of Sumatra, which triggered a horrible tsunami uh, back 20 years ago, horrible, where, uh, I don't know, half a million people were killed on December 26th. So, this is, you know, here in Israel, there is a potential for earthquakes, not so much in New Jersey, okay? So, that's what, so I know you asked me about um, the Olivet Discourse, you know, Matthew 24, and so on. These are very vague things, because if you're writing it and making it up, or you just, because you, you've seen natural disasters, you just say, well, there'll be natural disasters and wars and rumors of wars and so that's very vague. And what I'd like to do instead of like being uh, pedantic and just picking on little things, just say that in Tanakh, there's very specific prophecies. The Jews will be sent into exile. It will be a very long exile. Hosea chapter 3, verse 4 and 5. For many days, the children of Israel will be without a king, without sacrifices, without a temple, with none of that. None of those accoutrements until the end of days. Verse 5 of chapter 3 of Hosea. That's really very specific. When the Jews will return to the land and they'll serve God and David, which means Mashiach, 
their king. So that's really very specific. And what's very important for us is it is highly falsifiable. You understand? It's, it, these are not claims which can be, that are open to interpretation. They're very specific. You know, when Jeremiah in chapter 29, verse 10 says that you're going to exile for 70 years, well, that's a very specific prophecy. It's highly falsifiable. Right. Okay. So that's the difference between, you know, you know, day shorter, longer. Now there are passages in Joel, of course, which use the uh, examples of the celestial bodies, the moon, red. I don't think those should be taken literally at, at all. They can be. There's nothing wrong with it. It's not my view. But that's not what Tanakh is interested. Tanakh is saying, look, here's the deal boys and girls, if you follow me, the God of Israel, took you out of Egypt, you'll have what to eat. If you don't, if you turn away from me, this is what's going to happen. It's just going to stop raining. Here in Israel, it does not rain now during the summer. It never rains now, ever. I mean, I remember, I think I remember once in one summer, there was like a sprinkling. It was headline news. It just doesn't. So you better get your rain during the winter. I mean, fall, you know, essentially from October through, let's say, Passover. That's So if the terrorist says, look, it's just going to stop raining, who would write that? Only God would, because only God controls the weather. Only God controls history in a way that you can measure, and that's what HaKadosh Baruch is about. It's about prophecy. Why? It's not a magic show. It's not about poetry. It's about, I want to know who my Lord is. Who do you worship? Before whom do you bend your knee? To whom do you praise? The God of Israel. Thank you for your question. If you have found this channel helpful and this has blessed you or your family members in helping bring you out of idolatry, I would love to have your support. Please consider donating to this channel directly. That would be pretty awesome. Donations can be done through PayPal, Patreon, or through snail mail. The links to all are added in the video description below. You can also click this link and it will take you straight to my website with a donate button. This leads you right through PayPal. Thank you once again for your kindness and consideration for supporting this work. Blessings for you, your family, and your home. Shalom. Okay, moving on to the next caller. Uh, Judy, go ahead and present your question to, Hi, to Rabbi. Um, yes, how are you? I'll be quick to the point. Uh, I just turned it on and started listening, Rabbi, and as far as um, the virgin birth and dual prophecy, I want to quickly just give you my take and what I understand is that um, in the time of Isaiah, they were referring to Alma or young woman, which then years later, time of Christ, they were more referring to the Septuagint, which so over time, Alma really, even <laughs> bearing in mind that the Alma typically would be a virgin because she would be a young uh, moral person, but they in the New Testament referred to the Septuagint, which more, was more clarifying as far as being a virgin. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then, as far as the end times, it also says, you know, iniquity will abound, which we see that there'll be more pestilence, viruses, and also um, a falling away actually of the church, which is happening all now. And the most one more thing that Christians really see, and I guess Jewish people, for their own Messiah that they are anticipating, is the return of all the Jewish people to the land. So we're in that time, I think. I don't know if we agree on that. I'll just hang up, but those are just my comments. But I do think. Don't, don't hang up, and, Judy. Stay on, Judy, just, just for a minute. Just stay. Okay. Thank you for really putting up with me. No, I mean that. You're you're very sweet. I appreciate it. Let, let me just oh, ask I you this question. I can't hear that. I'm sorry. Um, That's all right. The question you is, now. you Go said ahead. a young woman would typically be a virgin. And I have, not, I just will deal with the Septuagint for a moment, but it is young women that have children rather than old women. So why would anyone say that a young woman is typically a Virgin, like where do you where do you get that from? Um, 
King David is called an Elem. He was certainly no virgin. In Proverbs 30, verse 19 and 20, um, uh, a, a, an adulterous woman is called an Alma. Cain derech geva biyama. So w- there is a way to say virgin in the Hebrew language. There's only one way in both modern and biblical Hebrew. So I, I, thank you very much for joining me. But I, I just want to bring that up. I know it's oh, go ahead. I just say that the the word kind of changed over hundreds and hundreds it, it of didn't. years. But it didn't. The word virgin more. appears in Isaiah five times. It's not like the word virgin never appeared. It didn't change. Really, nothing changed. I encourage you, look up the word virgin. Isaiah uses the word virgin. Uh, it calls the chosen... I mean, the word virgin is in Isaiah. The word betula is there. It's not like a word. I know that vocabularies evolve. I grant that. But that is not the case here. The word virgin is a very important word in Tanakh because Tanakh plays a great importance on virginity. And there's only one way to convey that, and that's through the word besula. The word alma, I mean, King David says, you you have hiksarta, you may... Uh, Alumosav, you have cut off the days of my youth. I mean, was King David a virgin? It it doesn't even make sense. So I just want to say that to you that it the language did not evolve. Um, the word virgin is in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah will use it if he needs to. In fact, the word vir- virgin betula appears in Isaiah more than the word Alma does. So it really doesn't cut that way. But again, thank you, Judy, for your thoughtful insights. I really do appreciate it. I want to just, one other part of this is the Septuagint thing. The writers of the New Testament were not using the Septuagint. The Septuagint was using the New Testament. I just, because this is something we really need to clear up. The original Septuagint, meaning there was a translation of the Torah of the five books of Moses that was produced about the year 256 BCE, so about 250 years before the Common Era, before Christianity. There was a translation for the Alexandrian Library, and we know a lot about it, so we have a lot of a lot of talk about it, okay? We have the letter of Aristides, we have Josephus, we have the Talmud. It really, there's a lot of discussion about this famed translation, but that famed translation is called Septuagint because it's the translation of 70, or the tradition is 72 Jews were involved in translating the Torah, the five books of Moses, into the Greek language. That's true, there was. It's lost. We don't have it. If you got your hands on the Septuagint of the... That's why in, with people who are not scholars you, use... The, and I, 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 That may sound... just the, Generally, people just refer to every Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible as a Septuagint. And it's a huge mistake because it's very misleading. It's not that you're trying to mislead anyone. This is what you hear in church. But as it turns out, that original translation was only of the five books of Moses. It was not of the prophets. It was not of the writings. Isaiah is not part of the Pentateuch. It's not part of the five books of Moses. So to say that the authors of the Christian Bible were relying on that old translation that was rendered 250 years before Christianity, where it said Parthenos, which in Greek can mean virgin, often does, doesn't only mean virgin, but we'll just leave it there. Let's just concede it because I need to make the point. It's completely fatuous. It's, you don't mean bad, but it's complete nonsense. That was only the five books of Moses. Now, what happens subsequently is that the Hebrew Bible is being translated into the Greek language. The Greek language was like the the lingua de franca. It was English is a much more dominant language today than Greek ever was ever. But we'll just use the English language as an example. Because of Alexander the Great, the Greek language just 
became the the dominant language. So, of course, there was a cottage industry of people just translating the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, into the Greek language. Here's what's confusing, and missionaries exploit this, is that every time someone translated the Tanakh into the Greek language, they called it the Septuagint. That's a nightmare. Now, ultimately, Origen, a third century church father, who was only one of two church fathers that was completely fluent in Hebrew and Greek. There was only two, him and Jerome. He produces a hexapla, meaning a multi-language column of rendition of all of the Bible. And that's what the Septuagint is. So what happens is the church is gets involved in this. It's not just the church. Jews are involved in this. This becomes a whole industry. Um, Achilla, there are all these Greek translations out there. But the point is the church will produce a Greek translation. To this day, the Orthodox Church, the Eastern Church, refers to the Septuagint as Scripture, capital S. It's like what the Vulgate is, the Latin translation produced by Jerome in the 5th century, is to the Roman Catholic Church what the Septuagint is to the Orthodox Church. So what the Church does is it then produces a corrupt Greek translation to conform with the corruptions of the Hebrew Bible found in the New Testament. So it's not that when ants gather, it causes human beings to have picnics. It's the other way in ar- around. The New Testament writers were not relying on the Septuagint. And I know that standard fare in seminary. I know that's typically how pre- it's not true. There's absolutely no source. The Septuagint is never mentioned in the Christian Bible. Never. But what happens is when things are repeated so frequently, people just, just well, of course, the Septuagint. It's all nonsense. I won't say it. It's all, it's completely fatuous. Moreover, the Hebrew Bible is the only thing that matters. I mean, Judy, you're a person of faith. You're only interested in what does the Hebrew Bible say, not what some translation says. I mean, a translation, a putative translation, can never be superior to the original, right? Of course not. So if we are if we want to serve god the bible is our authority and it it it's the the law of best evidence you're an american the law of best evidence in the united states is that only the original document in its original language is meaningful and translations are never superior to the original document Israel has the same law. Canada does. Every civilized country operates that way. So I know you've heard Septuagint all that. Reject that, or you're going to be in a lot of trouble. Yes, it's true. If you go on Amazon, absolutely, and order a Septuagint, I'll just show it to you. I'll just show you an example, okay, so you get it. The Septuagint, you can go online and look it up, I mean, right? The Septuagint also includes the apocryphal writings. What? <laughs> I mean, unless you're Roman Catholic, why would it, why would what, the Roman Catholic Church regards books as deuterocanonical books that you, I presume you're not Catholic, you don't believe those are holy books. How did that make it into the Septuagint? Do you understand? The ma- there are books like the Wisdom of Solomon, okay, which is not a holy book, okay, but some people came to regard it as a holy book. You don't, I presume. Well, almost certainly the Wisdom of Solomon was written originally in Greek. What are they translating? So that's you know what happens is, is you get into trouble. I, I want to present the following to you: the faith of Israel, the God of Israel can only be true based on the original text of Tanakh, not of based on some translation. Okay? So I just say go back to the original, not because of my authority, but because of the Hebrew Bible. It's not me. 
It's scripture. Look it up for yourself. And as I said, Isaiah didn't want to use the word virgin. Why? Because he was kind of Victorian and virgin. Was, no, the word virgin appears in Isaiah more frequently than the word Alma does. He had no problem using it. It appeared the word virgin appears all over Tanakh, all over the place. It was a very important word. Okay, the word Alma, okay, can mean it just means a young woman. In the English language, could a young woman be a virgin? Yeah, she might not be a virgin. Just there's nothing about young woman that conveys virginity. Virginity very specifically conveys sexual history or the absence of sexual history. Okay, please look it up for yourself. Go to the original Hebrew. Judy, thank you so much for having the courage to call in. Shalom. Okay, Clayton, you are live on the air. Go ahead with your question. Okay, good morning to you, too. Good morning, Rabbi. And uh, I I just have a question um, regarding the destruction of the temple back in 80 A.D. Um, Or, well, you know, the first century destruction of the temple. And the the, um, question is, in Christian circles which I've been in all my life, uh, except for since 2009, when I backed out of it. Uh, In Christian circles, we are taught, we were taught, that uh, the Messiah must come before the destruction of the temple. My question is, where are they getting it? Because I I haven't found it recently. Uh, Where are we getting that, and, and how do you defend it? Uh, I, I'm sure you're the right guy to ask. Thank you very much. Yeah. Hmm. Thank you, Clayton, for your call. I'll go ahead and hang up now and do your answer. Thank you. All righty. Rabbi? We have the best callers. No yes. question about that. We have the best callers. That's brilliant. So it, as you can guess by now, there is no verse anywhere in Tanakh that says that the Messiah would come before the destruction of the second temple. It's complete nonsense. You can look it up all day, all night. It isn't there. That's a spin of Christian apologists who want you to stay in church. They want you to call back the church and say, I'm coming back and put your money back in that plate that's passed around every Sunday. Okay? There's very good reason to resign from your church because it's idolatry. And these claims are completely fatuous. They're complete. These are mendacious claims. Okay? Where do they get this from? Where does this go? It's so, I call it mendacious because Tanakh very specifically, explicitly, it's not an inference, Hosea, just so you know, Hosea lived at the time of Isaiah, at the time of Amos, at the time of Micha. They all lived at the same time during the Assyrian Empire about 2,700 years ago. It's just important to get a sense of when people lived, when they preached. Hosea, just the opposite, tells us that the children of Israel will endure a very long exile and will be for many days without a king and without a prince and without a sacrifice, with a, without the eightfold, with any of the accoutrements of a base hamigdash of a temple. And afterwards, please... Please, I beg, I beg, I beg, look, drink, taste. It's, mama's delicious. Mama's so, so good, so delicious. And what does it say afterwards? Look, it says, actually, it begins with the word, Yeshuvu b'nei Yisrael uvikshu es Hashem Elohehem as David Malcolm, and afterwards they, the children of Israel return, and they will seek out the Lord their God and David their king. Islamish says this. And when will this happen? Look at the last two words, please. Let's. This is how a Jew gets high. Okay, forget the nations of the world. And this way of getting high is legal everywhere. You need it for your soul. Look at the last two words. So you just know I'm not taking it out of context. I'm not imposing my spin or reading on it. Please look at the last two words in Lashon Kodesh of Hosea 3, verse 5. When is this going to happen? If Mamish says in the end of days, and I don't care which translation you use. 
In Mamash says it. So the exile is going to be a very long time with no base having dush, no temple, no fast sacrificials, no king. Incidentally, this is a big problem for Christians. For Christianity, this is an existential problem. Why? Because Christians claim that you have a king. Christians claim that you have a sacrifice. Christians claim that Jesus is your temple. Did I make that up? Am I strawmanning this? Tell me. Tell me, and I'm talking to the Christians now, if you're Jewish or atheist or a Muslim, don't say a word. I just want to talk to the Christians. Am I making this up? Am I strawmanning this or am I steelmanning this? You know I'm telling the truth. Yes, Christian. Yes, the church. Do we have a king? They say, of course. I-N-R-I. What does the R stand for on the cross? Rex. King. Do you have a sacrifice? You sure do. Calvary, you have the Lamb of God. Do you have a high priest? Read Hebrews chapter 5, 6, and 7. Please. Please. It's all shtusim. It's mamashtusim. The Tanakh says openly that the last section of Jewish history be, will be a long time. 2,000 years. Okay, 2,000 years. Okay, That's a long time by any measure. And then, and during that period of time, you'll have none of those things. This is an existential threat to the church. Christianity can't be true. How will this period end? When Klal Yisrael will return to HaKosh Baruch Hu. And when will that happen? They'll seek at Hashem. Not that they'll be saved through a cross, through a lamb, through Golgotha, through Calvary. No, they have to do tshuva. Isaiah 59 verse 20 here. And what will they do in their repentance? They will be mevakesh. They will seek out the Lord and David, their king, who's Mashiach. When will this happen? Just so you know, this is the time now for every Christian to get down on his knees and say, Hashem, I accept you as my only Lord and my only Savior. That's it. It's enough. That's it. Now is the time. If you looked up what I just said, now is the time to confess your sins. You don't have to remember all of them. Say, Lord, I was engaging in idolatry. I did not know or I knew. And I regret my sin. I regret my iniquity. I regret it. And it's you alone that I bow before. It is you alone that I praise. It is you, you alone that I kneel. And I renounce Christianity completely. Now is the time. Now. If it says what I say, if it isn't, please shut the show off. If if what I'm saying now it does not comport to what the text says, please watch somebody. I don't know what to say to you. I don't understand it. I don't get it. This is a clear, transparent, crystalline prophecy. I'm not adding anything. I'm not telling you look up a Septuagint. I didn't say look up the Talmud. I didn't do any of those things. When I, I must say, until when will you repent? And I say this to the Jews who are watching, who may not be as committed to your faith as you could be. Now is the time to say, HaKadosh Baruch I love you. You're my Lord. You're my Savior. I need a personal relationship with you. I don't, I don't just accept you as my Lord and my Savior, but I want to be... I want to cleave to you. It's a mitzvah from the Torah to, ha- to cleave, to have devekus with Hashem, to cleave to Hashem. Hashem has to be the center of your life. This is the time if you're a ben Noach to say to Hashem, I renounce everything and you're my only one. To you alone do I worship. To you alone does my tongue praise. To you alone does my knees bend. Alone. I'm finished. Really. If your heart is made out of flesh and not stone, you will have repented already. All right, now, okay, now that we got that out of the way. So that's a clear prophecy, not the Olivet Discourse, the the rumors, wars, schmores, forget all that. That's all ambiguous. This is very clear, it's Pashat. Mamish Pashat. And when was it? El Tuvay Ba'achers Hayomim. And his goodness, they will seek out his goodness at the end of days. What do you want? What more do you need? Like, what do you need? Like, what? Like, what is it that you need to repent? I don't know. Like, what do you need? I mean, you know all the jokes. I don't want to tell jokes now, but 
Like, what do you need? Like, what does the Tanakh have to say that would persuade you to give up the ways and mores of the nations and turn to the God of Israel? If that's not enough, I don't know what is. I, I'm telling you straight away. I'm telling you straight away. How could a person not taste this honey on the tip of your tongue and say, Hashem, it's you alone that I worship. It's you alone that I serve. Very posh. Okay. All right, got that off. Now, where did they get this promiscuous idea that the Mashiach has to come and to die before the destruction of Second Temple? It, it comes from a false reading of Daniel chapter 9, specifically the last five passages. Now, what comes into view in Daniel 9 is Daniel is standing. You, you must understand this or you just won't understand it. I can just tell you it doesn't say that. And I could do away with that. Maybe you'll like me and believe me. I don't want you to believe me. You need to know. Daniel's saying the first year Darius to me. That's Daniel 9, verse 1. What's happened? Think. Use your brains. If Darius the Mede has emerged, who has, what fell? The Babylonian Empire. Okay? That means that's it. You have Darius the Mede, then Cyrus quickly takes over. So you have the Persian Empire emerging, emerges, okay? That means the Babylonian Empire is done. It's really technically the Neo-Babylonian Empire that only lasted for 70 years. This is a prophecy in Jeremiah 25, verse 12, okay? Now, but what is not happening is the children of Israel are not returning back to the land of Israel. Go to Jeremiah 29, verse 10. Daniel mistakenly, and he says this to me, you got to look it up. If you don't look it up, I can't help you. You know, if you don't look it up, then you're just going to choose a religion based on what makes you feel good. What your family and you know, people are Met fans. There are families that the whole family is a Met fan. If one person becomes a Yankee fan, they cut out of the will. I can't help you. It doesn't make sense to me, but that there are people. You have to be a Christian because that's the team. That's how you think the show is not for you. In any case, Daniel d conflates two prophecies of Jeremiah. The key point is the angel Gabriel is sent to Daniel and 490 years or 70 weeks, just so you know, when the term 70 weeks is used, every day of 70 weeks is a year. So it's not 70 weeks, but it's 70 weeks of years. Why is not germane now? Okay. So 490 years comes into view, specifically from the destruction of the first temple to the destruction of the second temple. But that period is divided up into sections. One section from the destruction of the first temple. How do I know that? It says it literally in Daniel 9, verse 1 and 2, the Chorvot Yerushalayim, from the destruction of Yerushalayim. So starting from the Churban of Yerushalayim, the destruction of the first temple, Solomon's temple, going forward, until the one who is a Mashiach, who gives the command to rebuild and restore Jerusalem and the temple, will be seven weeks. What did I tell you? How, if, a, if a day is a year, how long is seven, seven weeks? It's 49 years. From the time the first temple was destroyed until Cyrus the Great gives the command for the Jews to return back to Israel to build the base of Amigdash is exactly a half a century. How do you know Cyrus is the Mashiach, is the Messiah? What? Cyrus? I was a guy. He was certainly a Zoroastrian. How do I know? I'll tell you another time. It's not important now. So Cyrus the Great emerges 50 years, half a century after the destruction of the first temple, and he says to the Jews, go back to Eretz Israel. In fact, open up the book of Ezra. That's how Ezra begins. The whole, just open Ezra, start reading, and your brains will explode. Your frontal lobe will jump out of your spleen. You will be shocked, okay? So that he divides up periods. So now how do you know Cyrus is called the Mashiach by God? See Isaiah 45, verse 1. You should read 44, 28, the verse before it. Even The chapter break is artificial there, okay? We didn't do that chapter break, the Archbishop of Canterbury did it in the medieval period. Forget that. But 45.1 is critical. Cyrus, Kairish is Mashiach. And he gives the command for the Jews to go and to rebuild Yerushalayim. 
Okay? So that happens 50 years. That means 49 years have passed. What is 49 years again? Seven weeks. Now, be very careful. The word, this is the big piece, big takeaway. The word Mashiach, Hebrew word Mashiach, appears in the Hebrew Bible 39 times. 39 times. Got it? Nine and Dreitzik. 39 times. In all other places besides Daniel 9, that word is translated as anointed. But the Christian Bibles pull a scam off. A scam. Mamish a scam. Whereas in all other places where the word Mashiach appears in the Hebrew, the Christian translators render it as anointed, lowercase a. Because there's no capital letter in the Hebrew language. In English there is. But not in Hebrew. In Greek there is, but not in Hebrew. <sighs> And then the next segment is for 62 weeks. It will be rebuilt, the Sogma the Temple, Shri in Mot, but in troubled times. Those of you who are numerate will be able to do the numbers quickly. How long is 62 weeks? It's 434 years, okay? So he Daniel is being informed that, in fact, for in 434 years, it'll be rebuilt, but it'll be in troublous times. The second temple period was an, a very difficult period. Very difficult. In fact, during the entire Second Temple period, the state of Israel was a vassal state except for the Maccabean period, which was less than a century. Okay? But so it was not the glory days of David and Solomon and Uziyahu and Yotam. It was tough stuff. Was sometimes better than others? Yeah. But it was tough, that whole second number area. Then the last week is divided up, the last week, and you can ask your Christian friend, explain to you where this last week comes in, is it, what's a week now? Remember our numbers? A day is a a day is a year. So how long is a week? It's seven years. What's a half a week? Three and a half years. Okay. What happened three and a half years before the second temple was destroyed? What happened? Second temple was destroyed in the year 70 CE. I'd like you to use the term CE and stop using the word AD. I say it out of love, but just say CE, okay? AD means the year of our Lord. We don't want to do that, okay? So in the year 70 CE, the second temple was destroyed by Titus, okay, and Vespasian. What happened three and a half years, meaning a half a week before the Second Temple was destroyed, the Jews went to war with Rome. The war began in 66. Great. So from 66 to 70, that's a half a week, all hell breaks loose, and an anointed one is cut off, which means a high priest or the priesthood. Look, I'm a priest. I'm a Kohen. I'm a direct descendant of Aaron. I'm here. I'm alive, but I can't bring offerings. All the mitzvahs I say, almost all of them, I'm unable to keep now. There are prohibitions on me. I can't walk into a cemetery. There are a number of prohibitions on a priest. But all the karbanas, all the things I did, it's not just me. There are, I don't know, less than a million priests in the world today, right? None of us can bring the karbanas, the offerings that are in Leviticus, it's not the first time in history that there was no temple. During the days of Daniel, there was no temple. Okay, 70 years, no temple, no problem. I mean, problem, but life went on. Daniel was a tzaddik, okay? So what happened is the priesthood is cut off, or the high priest is cut off. It doesn't mean Mashiach. Now, what they do in the Christian Bibles, and I beg you, I beg you, look it up, is instead of translating the word Mashiach in Daniel 9, 24 through 27, as they do everywhere else, they translate it as Messiah, and they put a capital M there. There's no capital M in the Hebrew, there's no capital letter in the Hebrew language, and they insert a definite article that says the Messiah, Please look up to King James. You know, I'm not strawmanning this. I'm steelmanning it. And that's where they get it from. So it's a complete scam. It's a it's a complete spiritual circus act. And it's very important to get back to the Bible and ask the question, why every other place where the word Messiah, Mashiach appears in the Hebrew, do the Christian Bibles render it correctly as anointed, lowercase a, and only pink lechir do they translate as Messiah, capital M, and they put a definite article there, which is not in the Hebrew. Daniel 9's in Hebrew. 
Why? Because the church are a bunch of creeps that alter the text. Moreover, and you heard me correctly, so this is so promiscuous, you have no idea. This is a later invention. I do not blame the writers of the Christian Bible for this, because they didn't even have the brains to come up with it. Believe me, if Paul would have thought this up, he would have included it in his letters. He didn't. This was a second century scam, and therefore it's not in the Christian Bible. If it's so important, the Messiah is supposed to be killed before this before the struggle is like The New Testament authors never thought to put it in there. Go back to the original, learn the Hebrew, stop relying on these promiscuous translations, turn back to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, look at clear prophecies. We are now at the end, I believe. We should see the coming of the true Mashiach quick in our time. Thank you for your question. All right, very good. This will probably be our last caller. Uh, so caller Lisa, you are live on the air. Go ahead with your question. Yeah, hi, William. Hi, Rabbi. How's it going? It's Lisa from Moore again, again. Welcome back. Um, I recently heard that um, the writer of Luke Acts ripped off of Homer, you know, of uh, Iliad and Odyssey fame, although I don't think those are the exact works. I was wondering if the rabbi knew anything about that. So you're thinking that Luke Acts could be uh, plagiarized from something else, I guess? Right. Okay, so good deal. Okay, I, go ahead and hang up down to me for your answer. Thank you. All right, Lisa. So let me just say this to you. I am not an expert in the classics, and therefore I am not qualified to answer that question. I know of scholars who believe that and can show that who are experts in this field. There are people, some of them are Christians. You know, you have Dale Allison, you have brilliant people out there who are experts in the classics, and they can, they can from primary sources, demonstrate that to you. Now, notice something I do on the show is that I don't quote scholars. I go, let's go to the original text. However, my expertise does not extend itself to, to the writings of Homer or Cicero. I'm just not. So I'm not qualified um, to answer that question. What I can say, if we want to talk about plagiarism, is it is almost certainly that um, Josephus' Testimonium Flavium, Antiquities 18.3.3, is almost certainly a plagiarism, a ripoff of Luke, uh, uh, Luke's, uh, uh, Jesus' appearance to the men walking in Emmaus that probably is taken from there. That, that I can't say, but I'm just not qualified to answer your question about um, whether Luke Acts is a ripoff of the classic because it's just beyond the scope of my expertise. Okay? Fair, fair we enough. We have uh, time for another we question. Do, we, this, this, um, since this ended up pretty quickly, let me, let me fit this last one in. It's, it's one that's uh, um, sure. should be a pretty simple, quick answer. All right, um, go ahead, Kathy, with your question. Yes, um, um, yeah, this is Kathy Kennebec from Salem, Missouri, and um, my question is about cremation. Um, I've heard you say that we should never choose cremation when we die as our final disposition, so I just wondered what the rationale is for that, and what about those who were killed in a fire or were cremated in the Holocaust? That's good. That's a, that's something I've never actually heard mentioned before. Okay, thank you. Go ahead and hand down to you. Thank you. So a person should never be cremated, and you should not honor such a request. Okay, it's you'll tell me, but cremation is cheaper. Be buried in a forest in an animal cemetery rather than be cremated. Never permit that. It's from the bones that the resurrection will occur. You're not allowed to do that. Now, people, I know some of the last my question, but didn't they burn bodies in war? You find that in Tanakh. But what they were doing is it was a problem. If someone died in war, what do you do? Because the dead body spreads the disease, but they wanted to bury the body somewhere. So they were able to remove the flesh by using an acid, and then the bones would be brought back. But let's deal with this. In the process of cremation, it's, it's not just that they're burning the body, which they are. However, the bones from which the resurrection occurs, we see that in Tanakh clearly, explicitly. I mean, the, the vision of Ezekiel in chapter 37, it's the bone, it's from the bones that the body is reconstituted. 
Do not destroy the bones. Now, bones are filled with calcium. Calcium has a, a, a burn rate. It's just very high. So what happens is it, when they cr – this is, this is a little unpleasant, and I'm just telling you now. When chas v'chalila uh, cremations are performed, after – the the body is burned. the The bones have been damaged for sure, but they are not destroyed because the calcium is just not hot enough. Down into like a powder. And then they give that with the ashes to the family, but it's a ground bone. So now, why did Hakadosh Baruch Hu do this? Because the fires of Auschwitz, the fires of the of Auschwitz, wouldn't destroy it. People chas v'chalila, heaven forbid, who are killed in an accident, who are killed in in whatever in a burning fire, it should never happen to you. But if that happens, so that's exactly the point. The bones survive it. That's why they can go to a dentist. When the body has been completely burnt, what do they do right away? They look for the teeth. That's bone. And then they look at the dental records, and that's how I identify a dead body. Do you see? That's the, that's the whole point. So therefore, they didn't grind bones in Auschwitz. And in a fire, the bones aren't burnt. They're damaged, but not burnt. That's the point of it. So therefore, do not be cremated when you're 120. Do not ask for it. If you put it in your will, change your will today. And you should not honor the request of someone who asked for it. Now, I know someone's going to ask me, what happened to my grandmother I, who was cremated? I cannot answer that question. That's in God's hands. I don't, I can't, but cremation, no one, Jew, Gentile, never, never be cremated. The bones are preserved for the resurrection of the dead. Thank you so much for your question, William. Thank you so much for having me on. Very welcome, Rebbe. Thank you for your time and uh, thank you for tuning in. Be sure to catch us each week. Uh, stay tuned with my Facebook post and YouTube to be able to get caught up on notifications. Turn on notifications. Hello, my dear friends, hope this message finds you well. If you like the way this channel is going and the channel has been a blessing to you, please consider supporting the channel by going to the website, tanakhtalk.com. T A N A C H T A L K.com. Thank you once again for your time and for supporting Tanakh Talk. Shalom. Shafar